Hey, I'm Mitchell Holmes and I am the children's director at our Waterford location. Thank you so much for checking out this message. We're glad you're here and we would love to get connected with you and your family. One easy way that you can do that is by texting the word River Connect to 97000. That's River Connect, all one word, to 97000. You can also visit our website at theriverchurch.cc to learn more about us and some upcoming events. Lastly, if you'd like to give to the River Church today, you can text the amount that you'd like to give to 84321, or you can head to our website and click on the giving tab at the top of the page. Thanks again for joining us. We hope you enjoy today's message. Well, good morning, church. It is so good to see you all this morning, to see your smiling faces. If I, if I haven't met you yet, I'm Keaton. I'm the pastor of students and, and young adults here. There's something about that intro song. I just like was trying to resist like doing this up here. You know, I don't know, I don't know what it was, but it's, uh, it, was, it was nice. Whoever made that, I don't know who made that, but uh, it was good. A good way to start off the, the intro video, I guess you could say, but it is uh, good to be together. It's February. I don't know if you can believe it. It's, it's crazy. I just, uh, whether, whether you've been coming here for years or maybe, maybe like me, maybe you're a little bit forgetful, but every February here at the River is, is we, we call it family month. And so uh, we, we do a couple different things throughout, throughout the month. We have a bunch of events. We, re- we had our first event uh, that just this past Friday night. Right here in this building, we had our daddy-daughter dance. I'm looking around. I see a bunch of the dads that were here with their daughters. I loved seeing the pictures from it. And we had about 375 dads and daughters here, and that was awesome. We had, at the same time this past Friday, down at our Holly location, we had our first time ever we tried something new, our mother-son adventure night. And so, like I, I mentioned it last week in the announcements, we had a bunch of fun stuff there. We had over 400 moms and sons there, and that was a blast. I, I was down there with that event, and it was so fun to see the moms and the sons all together. And uh, really, the reason that we do Family Month is, is twofold. Number one, we want to encourage families to be together. We want to encourage parents to take the initiative in spending time with their kids. We want to make memories together, because I, I don't know about you, but for me, uh, the, the reason I think my best friends are my best friends are not because like, we sat in a room and looked at each other for like two years, right? It's like because we've done fun things together. We've made memories. We have stories together. And that's, that's our hope in Family Month, that we can do that for families. And then secondly, all month, kicking it off this morning, uh, we're going to be looking at God's Word. What does God's Word have to say about family? Because families can be messy. Families can be difficult at times, but also beautiful. I really believe family is one of God's greatest gifts for us. And, and so God's Word has a lot to say about it. And so this whole month, we're going to be studying the book of Ruth together. We're going to be kicking it off this morning. We're going to be looking at Ruth chapter 1. Um, I'm grateful, as always, for the opportunity to open God's Word with you. Let me pray for us, and then we're gonna, we'll, we'll dive in. Lord, to just come before you this morning. We slow down, and we... We quiet our hearts, Lord, in the midst of the busyness, in the midst of of everything that's going on, Lord, we just take this time and we we ask you to speak to us. Lord, I ask as we open your word, as we look at the example of Ruth and Naomi, Lord, that you would encourage tired moms and and tired dads, Lord, the person who feels like they, they don't have a family, their family might not look like what other people's families look like this morning. I just ask that you would, you would bless them through your word, Lord, that you would build them up as well. I thank you for the example of these two women, Ruth and Naomi, and for the example of faithfulness and, and honesty, Lord. And so I just ask this morning that you would, you would teach us, that you would speak to us through the power of your Holy Spirit. I pray this in the precious, the powerful name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, so if you got your Bibles, uh, you can turn to Ruth chapter 1 with me, where we're going to spend pretty much, pretty much our whole time together in the book of Ruth. Bounce around just a tad bit, but really we're going we're gonna to be there. We're going to work our way through um, all 22 verses, chapter 1 here. We're going to be looking at it. I want to give you a little bit of background, though, as... As you're turning there, or maybe it'll be up on the screens in just a second, we'll be in Ruth 1-1 in and, and a moment here. But I want to set the scene a little bit here, because without, without setting the scene, we're going to be a little bit confused as to what is going on. If you made your way to Ruth chapter 1, I want you to turn back to the left one page with me to the book of Judges. So the very last verse in the whole Bible, Judges 21, verse 25, 
sets the scene for us here as to what's happening in Ruth. So Judges 21, 25 says, In those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Now if you turn back to Ruth, it says, In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. So we're connecting these two books here. The, the book of Ruth is taking place during this point in the history of Israel where the judges are ruling. There is no king. And not only is there no king, everyone was doing what was right in their own eyes. It was a culture of selfishness and, and rampant sin. People were doing whatever they felt was good in the moment. I mean, to be honest, I don't think it's, in, in some ways, there's definitely some resemblance to our culture today. What feels right to us is, is what we do. And so this is the scene here in the book of Ruth. We, the author of the book of Ruth isn't explicitly stated. They don't come out and say who they are, but Jewish li literature attributes it to Samuel. And there's a couple of different themes that we're going to see this week and really over the course of the next three weeks, this whole month as well, all throughout this book of Ruth. The first one is that uh, 23 times in this book, there's only 85 verses, but 23 times in this book, the word redeemed is used. It's, it's a theme here. We're going to see throughout the course of the next couple of weeks, Ruth ultimately becomes the great-grandmother of King David. God is going to use her to do this ultimately of King David, of, of the lineage of the Messiah, and you can trace it all the way back if you look at the, the genealogy back in Matthew. You can trace it all the way back there yourself. So the first thing we're going to see, how God is redeeming people, how God is redeeming situations. Second theme here is God's providence, how God is working how God is moving, how his invisible hand is, is turning people and situations and circumstances, how God is working, even though uh, we don't specifically see any outright miracles in the book. But over and over, I want you to watch this whole month, especially we're going to see it in chapter one here, how God is working, how his invisible hand is moving situations for his glory and how he's looking to redeem people and what he's going to do here. So I want to pick it up, Ruth 1. One, or we'll read all the way down through verse five here. It says, in the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. And a man of Bethlehem and Judah went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech and the name of his wife, Naomi. The names of his two sons were Malon and Kilion. They were Epaphrites from Bethlehem and Judah. They went to the country of Moab and remained there. But Elimelech, the husband of Naomi, died and she was left with her two sons. These took Moabite wives. The name of the one was Orpah, the name of the other, Ruth. They lived there about 10 years, and both Malon and Kilion died, so that the woman was left without her two sons and her husband. What an intro to a book. What a terrible intro. What a terribly sad tragedy that begins here. We, we meet a couple different people here. The main characters here are going to meet Elimelech, who's the dad, his wife, Naomi. He's got two sons, Malon and and Kilion, and ultimately, their two wives, Orpah and Ruth. We read that there's a famine in the land at the time. The Israelites are in the promised land, which, if you're familiar with your Bible history, the promised land is the land known for flowing with what? Milk and honey. But yet, there's no milk, there's no honey, there's, there's nothing plentiful in the land. There's a famine here taking place. And I think if we take all this into account, as we look at the pattern throughout the book of Judges, ultimately, uh, we, we see that I, I believe this is really the discipline and the working of the Lord that there is a famine. I mean, for a place that's known for, for being extravagant and having all they need to all of a sudden there's a famine, I, I think that's the working of the Lord here. It, all throughout the book of Judges, there's a cycle that the, is, the Israelite people continue to find themselves in. First off, uh, they, once again, fall into deep sin. That sin leads them into slavery, and then they realize they're slaves. They reach out in supplication to the Lord. You follow the asses here. It's not like the Bible doesn't put it this way, but I put it this way to help us remember it. Sin, slavery, supplication, and then salvation. The Lord saves them. And after this, then they fall right back into their sin, and the cycle starts over and over again. And the Lord used situations like the famine to get their attention to call them back to himself, to awaken them to their slavery and their sin ultimately here. And so I believe this is what's happening again with 
this famine here. One other fun little tidbit. The irony here is so funny. It says that uh, he's a man from Bethlehem. Bethlehem actually means house of bread, but there is no bread in this house at this time. And so there's, there's a famine taking place. We, we read in verse 2, the name of the man was Elimelech, his wife Naomi, their sons Malon and Kilion. They were from Bethlehem and Judah. They went into Moab at this point, and they remained there. But Elimelech, the husband of Naomi, died, and she was left with her two sons. And so the father here, I think trying to do something noble, sees that there's a famine. He's struggling to provide for his family, and so he, he up and moves them to the, the country next door, the country of Moab here. Moving like this, though, back at that time was a bigger deal than it is today. For, for us, we could up and move to, I don't know, Oregon or something, and you know, wouldn't, have to do, wouldn't have to necessarily ask God for permission. Now, I would encourage you to pray and to seek the Lord, say, Lord, as you have this for us, but, but it's, it was a little different back in the, this time. You see, the Israelites, as I said, were in the promised land. The Lord had called them. The Lord had given them this place, and without seeking permission or anything like that, Elimelech up and just moves his family. They, they leave. I actually believe in doing this, he's disobedient to the Lord. He didn't hold the commands of the Lord very high, disobeyed him. I don't think, though, that Elimelech was the only man to ever make this mistake. You know, I, I just, I, I see what he did in seeking to provide for his family, a, a noble task. But I believe that was really his only priority. He didn't hold the, the, the commands of the Lord very high, and so he did what he had to do to provide for his family. I believe it ends up costing him in, in the long run here, but how many men, how many fathers, their number one priority above all else is to provide for their family? You know, providing for your family fathers, especially as we're here in family month, is important, but I think the first lesson here is that it's not the only important thing. Providing financially, providing in that sense for your family is, is a big deal. Fathers are called to do that, but that's not the only thing that you're called to do. How many of you, think with me for a moment, of, of your own life? Think of your father. I think this is a temptation that many fathers fall into. Your father provided financially, but he wasn't really around in the evenings. Or maybe your father, as you think back upon your childhood, he was around in the evenings, but he was not present. He was not aware. He was so exhausted that he paid little to no attention to you. Or maybe this, your, your father worked hard, and he, he, he said you know, that he expresses his love for you in providing for you. Now, again, fathers do do that, but if that's the only thing fathers are providing, we're missing something here. Your father provided, but he, he never told you that he loved you. That's a bit of my story. My dad was, he was a hardworking man. He, he is a hardworking man to this day. I'm grateful, so grateful for him, and he loves the Lord. And he was around in the evenings. He was around at my sporting events. He attended my games, and I'm, I'm grateful. He took us to church every week. He's in that sense, but he never told me he loved me. He never told me he was proud of me. And I, you know, I, I remember my mom saying, well, he, he, he provides for you. That's how he expresses his love. But that's only one aspect of, of loving and caring for your children. Fathers, just want to say again, providing for your family is important, but it's not the only important thing here. When you tell your kids that you love them, when you tell your kids you're proud of them, those are life-changing words to hear from a father. When you take them to church, that's going to leave an eternal legacy in their life. It's the hard work of being a father, leading your family spiritually. It's the legacy that's last, that, that'll last. I'd say, fathers, if you're looking where to start, begin by reading the scriptures with your children. It doesn't have to be every night, every day. Make an opportunity to read the scriptures with them. You know, I wish my dad had, had shared with me what God had been teaching him. Can you think of just the difference that makes, you know, dads, ask your kids, what has God been teaching you? And share what God has been teaching you. So I'd ask you, fathers, do your priorities communicate what is most important to you? Are you providing for your family in more than just the financial sense? And I just want to say, as I, as I look around to your young men, 
might not be married yet, if you have a desire to be married, you have a desire to be a father, it's not like you get married and just like everything changes, you become a perfect father, right? Like dads, I see the grins, you're like, oh yeah, yeah, that's, that's true. And so young men, if you desire to be this, begin cultivating these habits in your life now. Is the word of God a high priority to you? Is being at church a priority? Are, are you in a growth community? Because it doesn't, it's not like you just change when you get married. You know, Elimelech, I, I, I don't think to him it was that big of a deal to up and move his family. But even just this little disobedience, which little we could, you know, is up to interpretation how big or, or little it was here. But even just this little disobedience where he didn't hold the commands of the Lord very highly here, led, ha, had some, some long results here. And so, Let's pick it up, verse 4. We'll see just a little, some of the results here of his actions. His sons, speaking of his sons in verse 4, they took Moabite wives. The name of the one was Orpah. The name of the other was Ruth. They lived there about 10 years, and both Malon and Kilion died, so that the woman was left without her two sons and her husband. So because Elimelech took his family and moved them out of Israel into Moab, his sons then met their, these Moabite women who they ended up marrying here. And marrying a Moabite woman at this time was not explicitly like outlawed according to the, the, the Jewish laws, but it was definitely unwise. And you say, why, why would that be a big deal? Why, why is that unwise? Well, the God of the Moabite people um, was a detestable God to the Lord, the Almighty God. This was a God who, who their worship involved child sacrifice. It was cult-like. And so to marry a woman of this culture who worshiped this God, those things too were, were inherent, they were tied in here, was definitely very unwise. And Elimelech led his sons to this by bringing them to this land here. What may have been a practical decision by Elimelech to do his best to try and provide for his family, to go where there was food, I believe, showed his lack of trust ultimately in God's providing power. It showed his lack of trust in that God had brought them to this place, called them to be here in the promised land. And so he said, I, I don't care that God told us to be here. We're going to go. And the result of his actions were not just on him, but then his sons as well, his wives. And, and ultimately, we see Naomi, the wife Naomi here, Elimelech, he's, he's dead. His sons have died. We don't know exactly what caused their death. I don't I don't. I don't know if it was the judgment of the Lord. I don't necessarily believe so. But in the sad intro here, the first five verses, we see Naomi, and she's left. She, she went to Moab with her husband and two sons. Her two sons are gone. Her husband's gone. But now she has these two daughters-in-law. And so that's kind of where we pick up the story here. I want to read a, a, a long chunk for us. But let's continue the story in verse 6. We're going to read down through verse 14. So speaking of Naomi, she arose with her daughters-in-law to return from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the fields of Moab that the Lord had visited his people and given them food. So she set out from the place where she was with her two daughters-in-law, and they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. But Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, go return each of you to her mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you may find rest, each of you in the house of her husband, then she kissed them, and they lifted up their voices and wept. And they said to her, No, we will return with you to your people. But Naomi said, Turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Have I yet sons in my womb that they may become your husbands? Turn back, my daughters. Go your way, for I am too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, even if I should have a husband this, might, this night and should bear sons, would you therefore wait till they were grown? Would you therefore refrain from marrying? No, my daughters, for it is exceedingly bitter to me for your sake that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. Then they lifted up their voices and wept again. And Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. So in verse 6, Naomi hears that the Lord had visited his people. The Lord had given them food back in Israel. And so she says, okay, well, we've been through this terrible tragedy. The Lord is blessing once again in Israel. We should, we should go back there. So she is essentially trying to send her daughters-in-law off. She says, I, I can't provide husbands for you. Essentially, she can't provide, 
you know, children in that sense for them. She can't provide a future. She says, I'm, I'm, I'm no use to you. Wipe your hands of me. Go, go back. Go back to your families here. She says in verse 8, may the Lord deal kindly with you. She understood the faithfulness, the mercy of the Lord, and so she's really praying kind of this blessing over them as she seeks to, to send them home. Verses 9, 10, 11, they both want to return to Israel with Naomi. They say, we don't, we, we don't want to go back. We want to stick with you. She tries to convince them because she can't provide for them. In verse 13, she says something really interesting. I want to read. She says, my daughters, it's exceedingly bitter to me for your sake that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. In the midst of her trying to convince her daughters to go back, she says, she has this phrase here. She says, the hand of the Lord is against me. You know, and I, I think if I put myself in her situation, I mean, I would probably feel pretty similarly. <laughs> Her husband's died. Her sons have died. She's not even in her homeland, in her hometown. Probably doesn't know a lot of people around her. She says, the Lord Almighty, his hand is against me. But I think even in the midst of this tragedy, this is more admirable than or detestable that, that she say this. I think this is just a little hint of the picture that Naomi, that Naomi has of the Lord. She believes even in the midst of this tragedy that God is still working. She, she attributes this to the working of the Lord here. And so we see in verse 14, ultimately, Orpah kissed her mother-in-law. Orpah went home. She went back to her family. The book of Ruth doesn't tell us anything else about her. We can assume she went back to her family. She probably remarried at that point. But then Ruth does the unexpected. It says, but Ruth clung to her. Ruth stayed with Naomi, essentially giving up her future, giving up the chance of remarrying, giving up the chance of having children. I think she knew what she was giving up here, and she chose her mother-in-law instead of children and instead of a husband here. You know, in a time where it's marked by Judges 21, 25, as we said, in this time there was no king, everyone did what was right in their own eyes. Everyone did what was best for them. In the midst of this, God was raising up godly men and women, loyal men and women in the midst of the moral failing of a nation. I think the irony here is that this is not even a, a Hebrew and an Israelite woman, but yet still the Lord is raising up people in the midst of the failing of a nation. And I, I believe that, I mean, the same thing, I look out in this room and I believe the same thing, that God is raising up godly young people and godly old people, godly middle-aged people, whatever that might be, that stand out in the midst of a moral failing all around them. You know, the loyalty of Ruth, her commitment rings really loud in the context of selfishness and, and self-interest. It reminds me of what Paul writes in Philippians chapter 2, verses 14 through 16. I'll, I'll read it to you. You don't have to turn there unless you're like, Really, really quick. If you're super quick, you can turn there. But if you're not, just, just listen along with me. Paul says, do all things without grumbling or disputing that you may be blameless and innocent. Children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. Holding fast to the word of life so that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run or labor in vain. You know, for Ruth, she was this. Her commitment stood out. Her virtue stood out. She counted Naomi as more important than herself. You know, for, for the believer today, counting others as more important than ourself, it stands out. We shine like stars in the midst of a dark world. We stand out for the glory of the Lord ultimately here. So Naomi, when she sees this, she sees the resolve of Ruth. She lets it go. She stops trying to convince her. But I want to point out something interesting here. Even in the midst of this, as we say, look at Ruth in her example, which is a godly, loyal example. Ruth is not the hero of this story. Ruth is not the one that this story is ultimately about. Just like the story of David and Goliath, David is not the hero in that story either. The hero of these stories is ultimately the Lord. 
God is the hero of this story. He is the one that is working through Ruth to carry out his purposes. It's that idea of the providence that I mentioned is all throughout this book. God is the one working. God is the one using Ruth and Naomi as examples here. Just like we are not the hero of our story. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, our life is not about us, but it's about making the Lord and his name great. In our workplaces, in our families, with our friends, while we're driving down the road, like in all of these situations, it's not about us. God is the hero of our story, just like he's the hero of this story here. I love the way one of the commentaries, Kenneth Way, he puts it, he says this way, He says, Ruth's response to Naomi in verses 16 and 17 is foundational to the rest of the narrative and serves as her first recorded act of faithfulness through which God shows his own faithfulness to his people. God is using Naomi's faithfulness as his way to be faithful to his own people. It's about God's faithfulness. That's what this story is about. It's about God's redeeming power and God's providence and his faithfulness. And when we are faithful to the Lord, we stand out and he gets the glory and God uses us to accomplish his purposes as his people. God uses us when we are surrendered to him. When he calls us to be people who are cultivating the fruit of the spirit, it's not so that the world is filled with nice people. No, it's so that we stand out like shining stars in the midst of a broken generation that that needs it through and through here. And so God is using Naomi to express, or Ruth, to show his own faithfulness, ultimately, as we're going to see over the course of the next couple of weeks, to redeem his people, to send the Messiah through their lineage here. And so we come to this beautiful point here where Ruth expresses her faithfulness. Verse 15, she says, see, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return with her. But Ruth says, do not urge me to leave you or to return from following you. For where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die and there I will be buried. May the Lord do so to me and more also. If anything but death parts me from you. And when Naomi saw that she was determined, she said no more. She was convinced of her faithfulness. She let it go here. So in verse 19, they begin their return to Bethlehem. So the two of them went on until they came to Bethlehem. And when they came to Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them. And the women said, is this Naomi? She said to them, do not call me Naomi, call me Mara, for the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went away full and the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi when the Lord has testified against me and the Almighty has brought calamity upon me? They return to Bethlehem. The town, the women, it says, as as again, we continue this narrative of, of some women speaking here. The women said, is this Naomi? I think they recognize her. I think Naomi, after all she's been through, she's looking a little worse for wear. You know, they're like, is, is this Naomi? I think this is Naomi. But this reception here is not grand. As, as you can probably see in your footnotes, Naomi here, her name means pleasant. And she says, don't call me pleasant anymore. She says, call me Mara, for the Lord, for the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. This reception that Naomi has back in her hometown, rather than soothing her pain, it exacerbated it. She left with a husband and two sons, and she came back without them. She's experienced great loss here. And so she feels it more bitter, or more fitting to be called Mara because Mara means bitter. She says, I'm not pleasant. I don't deserve to be called pleasant. That's not how the Lord has dealt with me. The significance of, of a name is something that's, I think, really lost on us today. I, I, I don't know what my name means. I don't, it's not that big of a deal to me, probably to many of us around, but names are a big deal, especially in the Old Testament. We see it in the New Testament too, but I think it's some people whose names the Lord changed. Familiar with, with the scriptures, the Lord changed Abram and Sarai to Abraham and Sarah. He changed Jacob to Israel. 
He changed the name of, or ultimately Joshua changed the name of Heshua, or no, sorry, Moses, forgive me. Moses changed the name of, of Heshua to Joshua. This is significant here, and it's not to say that if the Lord didn't change someone's name that they can only live out what their name means. That's, that's not it, but there's a significance here to God changing names. And so, so Naomi says, I, I, I'm not pleasant anymore after what I've been through. And to be honest, I, I'm not sure I can blame her much. But in through all of this, she takes God seriously. She says, God has dealt with me bitterly. Verse 21, she says, I went away full, and the Lord has brought me back empty. The irony of, of her saying she left full is that why, why did they leave? Why did they leave in the first place? A famine. They, they were not full physically, but yet she still is saying that she's, she left full. She says at the time again that she's coming back empty. Now she does not have her husband or her sons, but she's not totally empty. Who does she have with her? She has her daughter-in-law, Ruth, with her. She's not completely empty, but pain and tragedy has a way of doing this to us, where we exaggerate a little bit the things we're feeling. We feel alone in it. You know, we take things literally or, or, or whatever, you know, that might be. Our pain has the ability to turn us inward, where we see I, I was this way and then this way, but now everything's been taken away. When not literally everything, though it has been a lot, has been taken away. But I think one of the keys here is that Naomi attributed the loss of her husband and her sons to the Lord. You know that... Attributing a loss to the Lord, that sounds like something a preacher should preach against. That sounds like a, a bad thing. But I believe ultimately, Naomi, her picture of the Lord and his sovereignty is so big that she believes even in the midst of what she's feeling, in the midst of her loss, the Lord is still working, that the Lord was in control of this. And I'm also so grateful for the way the Holy Spirit penned these words that they didn't take these out here, that she openly voiced her complaint of the grief and the pain that she's experienced. She openly voiced this to the Lord and to those around her. I, I, I've heard people, and I think so many people pile on Naomi here for saying, how in the world could she be bitter? I, I don't think she was bitter at the Lord. I think she was bitter at life and what she had gone through. I think she saw the Lord as in control of this and ultimately was attributing this to him, saying, I don't know what he's doing, but I do know that somehow God is still in this and God is using this. In a moment where it feels so easy to be forgotten by the Lord, she does feel like the Lord might be against her. She doesn't know what he's doing, but yet she still attributes to him. As far as we can tell, this wasn't the Lord disciplining Naomi. This wasn't a result of her disobedience or something that she brought upon herself. And for us today, sometimes suffering happens in our life, not as a result of God punishing or disciplining us, but because he's looking to glorify himself through us. God is looking to, to make his name great through a situation that he's using us for. God is looking to make himself great through the life of a believer. But it's not easy, and it doesn't always feel like that. My wife Haley and I have been here recently. We've been kind of wrestling through this a little bit firsthand. On Christmas, uh, we found out that Haley's mom, my mother-in-law, has cancer, ovarian cancer. And... Uh, it's been, it was a rough couple of weeks for sure at the beginning of that. And I began to think through myself, how am I going to deal with this? How do you get through this? And I think feeling a little bit of what Naomi has felt here, the confusions, the questions, saying, God, why are you doing this? God, what are you doing in the midst of this? And so I, I remember Soon after, my, my wife and I, we had flown home. We were in Denver visiting some other family. We flew home to, to be with her parents. 
And I just had to go for a drive to process. That's kind of one of the things that I do to, to process. And I began to read the scriptures. I began to listen to a couple sermons and say, God, where, where do I go with this? God, how, how do I deal with this? How do I move forward? God, what are you doing in the midst of this? And I, I learned, I think, a really important lesson for myself. And it began with me first. That in the hurt and the questions, the confusions, we have to bring that to the Lord. I saw that this is the proper response to the questioning to the grief, to the pain. If you're like me, I wanted to get alone and I wanted to get angry. I wanted to say what in the world and why and how, and I, I did some of that. But I don't think asking God why is, is wrong. I don't think asking God why is, is necessarily dangerous. I think like Naomi, she believed that even in the midst of her loss, God was working through it. I think when we're honest before the Lord, asking him the tough questions, that's the best place we can be. And I had to ask the Lord these tough questions, and I don't have all the answers to them. I'm still asking him, and I'm still seeking his wisdom on what he's doing. But the danger is when we sit alone in what we're feeling. The danger is when we allow our minds to go and go instead of facing the reality of what we're going through. Naomi faced the reality, but she didn't have to. She could have ran from it. She could have pretended it didn't happen. You know, for us, she, you know, she, I think the temptation is to run from what we're feeling with the, just another episode of the TV show or I'm going to scroll TikTok or Instagram Reels or Facebook or whatever it might be for you, whatever we do to not face reality, whether it's pouring yourself a drink or just another drink or go to the gym just a little longer. I don't know how you process these things. I don't know where you go when you feel hopeless. But the place we need to go and the best place for us is the presence of the Lord. It's not easy to go there. It's not natural to bring our questions and our hurt Towards him, it can be scary, unnatural, and uneasy to turn off the distractions and to be real with the Lord, to tell him how we're really feeling. But the presence of the Lord is where we hear from him. It's where he speaks to us. It's where he comforts us. It's the best place you can be. And so where do you go when you find yourself in a hopeless situation? Do you get bitter? Do you run from the Lord? What do you turn to? If I can encourage you where to turn, turn to the Psalms. David, all throughout the Psalms, we see his honesty before the Lord. We see him wrestling with the Lord. We see him in some ways even accusing the Lord of things. I, I, I don't know if I would quite go that far, but maybe, I don't, I don't know. You know, I'd say turn to the Lamentations. Entire book of lament, a book of honesty, a book of asking, a book of saying, Lord, I don't know what you're doing. Process with the Lord and, and his word. Call the friend that you know will not only pray for you, but will pray with you. Those are the best kind of friends. Those are the best kind of people. And I just want to say, what do you do when you have someone that you love that finds himself in a hopeless situation like this? I just want to say, maybe from some experience in my own life, in the moment, things like Romans 8, 28, we know that in all things, God works together for the good of those who love him. God works all things together for good, those who are called according to his purposes. Those things aren't the most helpful things you can say. You know, hearing when my mother-in-law has cancer, but then someone's saying, don't worry, God's going to use it for good. Like, that, that makes my feelings feel invalid. That, that's not the most helpful thing you can say. One of the best pieces of wisdom that I was given was, instead of Romans 8, 28, two verses earlier, Romans chapter 8, verse 26, remind people of this. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. If you've ever felt hopeless, hopeless is when we don't know what to say. 
when you don't know what to say to the Lord, you don't know what to pray, but when you take that step to be in the presence of the Lord, the promise of God's word is that the Holy Spirit, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, is praying for you and with you, is interceding before you, saying the things you cannot even say. And so you say, I don't have the words, I don't know how to pray, I don't know where to go when I'm feeling like this. Quiet yourself before the Lord, turn off the entertainment and spend some time in the presence of the Lord and be honest with him. Or this is what I'm feeling. Or I don't know what I'm feeling. I don't know what to say. It's the best place you can be. You know, this is the promise that applies to those whose Lord is the God of Israel, the God of Naomi, and the God of Ruth here. This is our God who redeems. No situation is too far gone for his power. No person is too far gone. 23 times in this story, the word redeemed is used. That's what our God is in the business of doing. Your hopeless situation, the Lord can redeem that. Eight times in this chapter alone, the word return is mentioned. This is a story of redemption, but it's also a story of, of return here. You know, the person who's been running from the Lord, whether you're here or you're finding this online at a later date, you find yourself running from the Lord because of a situation you felt hopeless, you turned away from him, you're not too far gone. Naomi had the courage to return to her hometown to come back to the place that God had for them, to return to her God who had provided once again for his people. It's time to return to the Lord, to come back to him with your flaws and your weaknesses. Be honest with him. Or maybe for you it's time to turn to the Lord for the very first time. You know, you've been wrestling through something. You've been saying, Lord, I just, I need to hear from you before I make a decision to follow you. Or you're here in this story and you're saying, I don't, I don't have hope. I don't have the Holy Spirit. I don't have that. Well, the good news of Jesus Christ is for all. Let today be the day of salvation that even when we were at our lowest, when we were at our most hopeless points, the Lord was there. The Lord is there. You know, when we were deep in our sin, 2,000 years ago, before this even began, the Lord knew what he was doing. He sent his son, Jesus Christ, to this earth, born of a virgin, to live the perfect life that we couldn't. And in this life, Jesus Christ, he, he experienced the entire gamut of being human, he experienced loss and sorrow and grief and pain. But in the midst of it all, he was perfect. And then as a result of it, the leaders of the time, they killed him on a cross. And on that cross, he took the weight and the punishment for our sin, our shame, the wrong that we've all done. He killed him, he was dead for three days, and then he came back to life to show that he's stronger than sin and death and Satan, to show that he's in the power of redeeming and making new. He paid the price so that we can be redeemed. And Romans 10, 9 says, if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That's the good news of Jesus Christ, that he redeems people and he redeems situations. That's what he is about here. So I want to read one more verse here as we wrap up. Verse 22. Naomi returned, and Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law with her, who returned from the country of Moab, and they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of barley harvest. The famine was over. Once again, God was providing for his people. The story of Ruth is a story of providence and redemption, how God provides and how he redeems. No person is too far gone for the Lord. No family is too far gone. God is the hero of this story through and through. Over the course of the next couple weeks, we're going to continue to see how God is working in this situation, even when Ruth and Naomi don't see it. So I'd encourage you, don't miss a week. Be back the next couple of weeks, the next three weeks as we continue this. And I want to say, just like the Lord was working in the situation of Ruth and Naomi when they didn't see it, he's working all around us today. If only we take the time to sit with him and to see it. And our questions, our confusion, our hurts, bring it to the Lord in honesty. The presence of the Lord is the best place we can be in it. If you need to talk with someone, 
Grab myself, grab anybody with a lanyard. We would love to share with you the good news of Jesus Christ and what he's done. If you need prayer, I'll be down over here. Josh and Jen are usually there. They're not here this morning. I would be happy to pray with you. If you find yourself in this situation, if we can pray for you, please don't be alone in this. Grab someone around you. Grab somebody with a lanyard. Let's pray.